Welcome back to Following Know It On, a Stormlight podcast. This week is episode 147, and we are summarizing and reviewing The Final Empire by Brandon Sanderson. We have finished the book. This is on the entire book. If you'd like some of our specific thoughts on the epilogue or the very end of the book that was last week, you can go watch that one. This will be an entire retrospective of the whole book. Paul, how are you? Oh, so great. This is, I think, my favorite kind of episode that we do. Just uh, kind of giving our ratings of the book, comparing it to others, and it's honestly a ton of fun. So I'm super excited for this, as always. Elliot? I'm doing great. I literally, just before this, walked inside after our Memorial Day picnic where we had family running around like crazy outside the house. So this will be a perfect way to wind down after a, a long day, talk about some Mistborn. Sounds good. We will be doing our ratings of the book. We'll be talking about general thoughts and feelings on the book. We will also be comparing it to some other uh, Cosmere works that we've read. We'll spoiler flag those when appropriate. So if you haven't read them, um, there's still plenty in this episode for you to to get. So we'll we'll spoiler categories anything that we're going to talk about um, in comparison. We'll also be doing some favorite quotes and some favorite characters and predictions uh, for Mistborn moving forward. So let's roll the intro and let's get going. I think I'll just go ahead and kick us off with my ratings for the book i will go first and then you guys can find over whoever would like to follow up this is split into five different categories if you've not seen one of these before uh the first one is plot then characters then world building theme and point of view we're going to score each of those categories out of 10 uh to a total score out of 50 because there's five categories so the end rating is what it comes out of the ratings that we're giving in each of these smaller categories for the first one i gave plot a seven and my quick synopsis of that is i do enjoy the plot of mistborn the the final empire it's very plot driven um the entire time you're on this one linear storyline with vin and kelsier it hardly deviates at all for maybe a couple paragraphs here and there to talk about maybe Ferrochemy for a, a paragraph and then maybe like some inquisitors, but all of it is fairly related to the, to the main plot. So it, it's fairly, it's fairly dialed in where my points are deduct, deducted from is likely just a flaw of it being an early book for Brandon Sanderson. It's fairly vanilla for me, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It does what it does well and correctly. In my opinion, there isn't, that much spice in it for me um and as it goes i don't want to say predictable because on a first read it's certainly not predictable but i because i know knew where it was going because i've read it before the the plot twist didn't like grab me like they usually do in a brandon sanderson book um but for this one i'll just go with seven Characters, I also gave a seven, and I want to talk about characters more later with uh, with the context of other Cosmere books. Um, but for now, I'll give it a seven. I really do enjoy the characters that are presented. There's something about the writing in Mistborn that doesn't quite grab me, like other works that Brandon Sanderson has written. Um, and other characters specifically in those works. And I don't know, I don't know why that is. I, th I we're going to have a, a discussion later, um, probably full Cosmere spoiler, or at least what, what we've read, um, Cosmere spoilers discussion later, and we'll deconstruct that. So we'll, I'll, we'll come back to characters later. World building is an eight. I really do enjoy Scadrial. I think it's nice and gloomy and dark and beautiful in its own way. Um, one of the, there's a one liner in the book that actually pulls the world building from a six to an eight for me. And it's towards the beginning of the book. 
and Vin describes the starlit sky to illuminate the mists at night, and you can actually see f fairly, like, you can see within like 10 feet of yourself just via starlight and the dissimulation of light from the mist via starlight. And that that captivates me as an as a mental image and I really love that um so the entire like any night fight sequence that we see later in the book is framed in that in that night starlit ambience and I I really enjoy that. Theme, I went with a 9 and that is simply because I really do enjoy um young underdog takes down big um scary the lord ruler like it it's it's pretty it's pretty easy uh to to have a theme like that but i think it is executed extremely well in mistborn i i really enjoyed it my second read i enjoyed mistborn a lot more my second read than i did my first um so theme is a nine and then point of view is an eight uh point of view is kind of like how you are presented with information at least that's how i interpret point of view and on rating and i enjoy vin as a, a point of view character i enjoy kelsey as a point of view character both are intriguing both have good internal dialogue that other characters aren't listening to but the reader's listening to i do enjoy that dynamic and how brandon sanderson plays with that eight out of ten um for a final score of 39 out of 50. Who wants to go next? I uh, I actually really want to. I've been eager to hop in. Um, so right before I hop in, I just want to briefly like talk a little bit about how I graded these and how I think honestly we have graded them. A seven and an eight is a really good score. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't mean oh we didn't really like it. Like a ten is like really above and beyond. Like like I can't think of anything better if that makes sense. So whenever you hear a lot of these like sevens, eights, you may even hear a six or so. Um, uh, we still love this book, or I, I love this book for sure. Uh, but Brandon Sanderson has, sets a really high bar, and we also are grading pretty strictly. But without further ado, I gave plot a little bit higher than Trevor at an eight. And the reason that I gave it an eight is mostly because like it's, the actual like, storyline, what you're seeing, is very engaging from chapter to chapter. There's not a whole lot of time that it slows down. Uh, it's it's very engaging, and it's very, very well written um, in how action sequences go out. And then the times that it does slow down is also very like inquisitive and engaging. Like The ball scenes that we have throughout the book yeah. are some of my favorites, which... Normally, when I read books, that's not what I like. I want the action. I want the like high octane moments, the like big reveals, all that stuff. And honestly, the balls were, like did such a great job. Um, that also goes into my world building score a little bit, but that's later. Um, for characters, I gave it a seven. And honestly, with characters, that, well, this is this is why I wanted to preface how I'm rating these. I don't think Brandon Sanderson did anything wrong with his characters. However, and maybe it is kind of like the first book flaw and that like we've talked about the stage at which Brendan Sanderson is writing this in his career as an author. He didn't make this a huge book. He 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 didn't he kind of limited the perspectives. He kind of narrowed in things compared to other books that we see. And so the characters I think are awesome and well written. But you don't see that much. You don't learn all too much about the characters or anything here. This is also the first book of a trilogy. So, I, I mean, I'm not going to talk too much about the rest, but this is by far, like, this is the lowest score I have as a character score for any of the books in the first era. Um, because you just don't see too much of the different characters. World building, I gave my highest rating of a 9. And that is because I think the way that the world building is worked into this story is just like a masterpiece in writing skill of like, I have such an excellent picture of what is going on and what the world looks like, like, like not only like appears like, 
like visually, but also like the culture and the his bits of the history. And it's so eloquently written in this is an action novel. It's not near as deep on the like high fantasy end, but it still does such a great job of really making you feel like you understand the world around you. And I think it's beautifully written in that way. Which brings me to my lowest score, which is actually theme. I gave theme a six. And while I think this is a very, very well written story, there's not much that I take away from this part of the story. I think there is bigger stuff in the Cosmere as a whole, which I won't get into more in, in this era. But this story alone is like an action novel that I don't take all too much away from in like a real world application or like a theme or I guess the really get like feel good message, if that makes sense. So that is why it's my lowest score. And then point of view, I have an eight. Um, it's very like narrowed in and direct. The point of views you have mostly with Ven and Kelsier. Um, but it's just very well written. I don't have a ton to say on this, but it's it's just very well done. Um, so yeah, th those are my ratings. Giving it an overall like total score of a 38 out of 50 for our, our rating system here. Paul, I, I agree with everything you said at the beginning about kind of the, the scale that we're rating these books on. I'm a, I was a little harsh in my ratings that I'm about to to go through, but that doesn't necessarily reflect the enjoyment I had going through the book. I I liked the book a lot. And honestly, I probably would rate it differently if this was the first Brandon Sanderson work I'd read versus kind of reading some of the others. I, I feel like I have to rate it kind of relative to some, not just Brandon Sanderson works, but other fantasy works as well if you took this book kind of in a vacuum and examined it for kind of a standalone first entry into a, a universe pretty much you know it's not the first book he wrote but kind of it, it's a it's an entry point into it. it it might stand on its own fairly well whereas i'm going to be a little nitpicky and poke on some stuff that's not quite to my personal taste but yeah I'll jump into my numbers. For plot, I had a I had a seven. It, it's definitely very good. It's it's Sanderson. He's very good at writing engaging and creative and interesting plots. I, I definitely was not bored at any point throughout the the book. Even the the slow spots were great. Whether it was a ball that was kind of some of that more political drama, or whether it was Sazed teaching me about Ferrochemy or Kelsier teaching me about Alamancy. Those were some of the moments of the book that I actually liked the most, I think. So that the pacing was was really nice, maybe a little rushed in areas. I I just personal taste like longer form works, like a Stormlight, perhaps, that gives me a little more time to delve into some of the lore, whereas I feel like we didn't quite have as much time to get into the setting, if you will, of the, the book. So maybe a kind of a few points docked there. I think my biggest hit on plot is and i talked about this in some of our past episodes i'm a little thrown off by the twist the not 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 kelsey or dying that that was done well what i don't like or what i'm still uncomfortable with is the idea that that was the intention the whole time it felt a little too forced in my mind of a plot twist and so i think plot is where i'm going to take off a few points for there I will caveat this with I'd be I'd be fully willing to amend this on a reread. If I reread this book, I would be happy to revisit my rating here, but on a first read, I feel a little bit jerked around as a reader, just, just a little bit, not a lot. And so 7 is where I I landed there. Characters, this was my lowest rating. I went with 6, even a little lower than than some of you guys. Vin is very good. I like her character a lot. Kelsier is very interesting. Beyond that, though, I'm a little, I don't know, not super into a lot of these characters. There wasn't a whole lot that really kind of grabbed me about a lot of these, these people. And even you know, Kelsier, very much like I kind of expected from the start, I was very 
very torn about Kelsier. There's elements of, of Kelsier that are awesome. There are elements of Kelsier that are really frustrating. And so I I went lower on this one just because the characters weren't quite as engaging for me as some other works, perhaps, but still solid. Vin's journey is is definitely good. I'm hoping for more in future books, which we'll talk about a little bit later. World building, I mean, it's Brandon. He does fantastic. I love the magic system. The magic system, excellent. Some very strong points there for world building. I, I went with an eight for world building just because I want to see more. I want to see more of Scadrial. I feel like we didn't explore much of it. I yeah. feel like I understand Luthadel very well. I don't feel like I understand much else about schedule. Maybe the entire planet is just ash and there is nothing else to explore, but that was kind of my, uh, I was left wanting, even though what we did to get to explore was really well done. So eight out of 10. Theme, I went with seven. It was definitely kind of darker, exploring some of those more grim elements of a world that is really downtrodden and that wasn't quite as enjoyable for me so i i took some some knocks off there that said the the result of the book with keltier's sacrifice and vin's you know grit that gets her to the end to defeat the the lord ruler very very inspiring in those moments and i loved those elements of the the theme for sure i'd like to see more of vin's journey play into the theme more I'd love to see Vin's process of self-discovery and self-appreciation becoming a more central part of this story. That would up the theme for me. Point of view, last one. I went with eight out of 10 on point of view. I really like how Brandon writes with his you know, point of view where we are as a reader. We're not fully third person. We're not fully first person. It's kind of a little bit in between where we're seeing the world through some one of the characters' eyes, but we're not full-on first person, you know, hearing all of their thoughts or or seeing it at the way they're seeing it, which which hits a really nice sweet spot for me. And and Final Empire was a good example of that. We got to explore Alamancy through Vin's eyes, which was really cool. And yeah, it was good. I maybe take a few points off here tied into my beef with Kelsier's plot twist in that what I don't like is that if Kelsier's plan the entire time was to die, I feel like if I was in Kelsier's head, I should have picked up on that. Yeah. And so point of view gets a little bit of a hit for me there. But overall, extremely strong novel, 36 out of 50. Sounds good. We are all in the upper 30s. Do any of you want to start off with a general thought on the novel and we can kind of just go from there? I, I might open this with a, a question to you guys. We Maybe all of us kind of alluded to this, but maybe we could spend a few more thoughts on it. Do you, do you think about this book differently because it was written so early on, early-ish on in Brandon's career, as opposed to like a rhythm of war that is, help me with the timeline here, 15 years after this book? 20, yeah, 14 years, 2020 and 2006. Okay. So quite a bit of time there. Do you, do you look at Mistborn differently because of that? I definitely do. I was struggling to figure out how to grade the book for a little while because I didn't know if I need to just look at it in a vacuum or if I need to like look at it compared to the other books that we've read. I, I think, yeah, like you said, I think if we looked at it in a vacuum, it would have been very different. Like, like my ratings probably would have been a little higher. Um, but also, yeah, looking at it and taking the timeline into account, like the real-life timeline of when Brandon Sanderson wrote this book, it does affect it a little bit for me because I feel like there's probably a lot he left out that he would have had in the book. Um if it weren't at that stage in his his career it is my guess i'm sure there's a lot that takes up but also i mean my my thought about this book my general thought about this book is that i think there's like honestly nothing wrong with the book it just kind of naturally suffers a little bit from being the first 
in the trilogy, the introduction to the world and the introduction to these characters, um, that like later books won't suffer from. It, it's just like a setup, you know. I feel like the Wave Kings has time to set up, and then plenty of time still left for a like fully fleshed out story and twists and like everything. Um, and this didn't have as much time, so I feel like it suffers more from being set up and we can only be so attached to these cha- so attached to these characters because we've only had so much time with them kind of thing. So that that's my general thought is that it just suffers a little bit from <clears throat> more developed books and just being the introduction to to a series. I feel like you always hear of like middle book syndrome or or, or middle book problems, you know, but I feel like this is like a first book problem. It's really interesting what you just said, Paul. You- let me clarify again. Because you are comparing it to other works, you rated it lower? Is that what you said? Yes, a little bit. Like, a little bit. Like, comparing it to the other Brandon Sanderson works. So so there were two different things that I said. The first was thinking about it in the context of the other books Brandon Sanderson has written mm-hmm. and the stage of time which in which he wrote this book. It, like... I guess it hurt the ratings a little bit. I, I, in that, yeah. I understand what you're saying. The other part of what I was saying was that the book itself suffers by being the like first book in the series. Like a lot of the things, like characters and like theme, and some of the other things, like world building, is one too. That like those get fleshed out so much more that those are benefited from way more in the later books because of the setup in this book. But this right. book doesn't get to like reap as much reward, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I, I think I am rating this book more generously because of where it's written in Brandon's timeline. So I specifically like the theme. I, I gave theme a nine simply because I understand what Brandon is trying to accomplish with the book. Not necessarily the execution of it, which I do think the execution is fine, but I I gave the theme a nine simply because I know where this was. So to back to your question, Elliot, absolutely. I, I cannot think of this book without considering the publication date. Um, and I we even started this podcast with the idea of Mistborn um, was published first. And it's, I, I don't view Mistborn as strong as Stormlight. And I think that's a fairly common um, viewpoint. There's plenty of people that like Mistborn more than Stormlight. But as far as like a writing strength, I think a lot of people would agree with me that Stormlight is stronger written, stronger words than Mistborn. Did I mix up any nouns there? Are you guys on, on board there? No, that makes sense. Yeah, and and I agree. Without going into it too much, I feel like overall Stormlight has way more of like a moral element. I feel like all of the like moral and ethics talks that we've had uh, regarding Mistborn is completely I guess made up by us. We're like Hmm, Kelsier did this thing. That's kind of sketchy, but no one ever talked about it. Like, yeah. what do y'all think? You know, whereas that stuff, the questions like that are pondered a lot in Stormlight. Um, so yeah. I would say that's an entire element that's just not in this story that is in Stormlight. It, it, thus, say, I, I do agree with you. Uh, I, I do agree with you that Stormlight is more like overall well written. Um, but that's not, uh, I didn't fault misborn for that i would even go one step further than what you just said in that in specifically the final empire those hard questions are deliberately avoided by our characters specifically kelsier there are several times in the book where there's someone on the team who's uncomfortable with the way kelsier is presenting himself to the ska and kelsier deliberately says don't talk to me about that do not bring that up and I will, I'll, we'll, we can talk about it later. That, that that phrase is used like four or five times 
Kelsier dies, it's never talked about. So I th there's a more deliberate like I don't care if this is morally ambiguous, I'm going to do it because end goal. And I'm not yeah, I don't know. That that's as far as that that thought went is that it's it's a, it's more active it's more actively subdued by Kelsier, I think, than just not talked about. In my mind, it's almost hard to rate a book like this because a book like Mistborn here, Final Empire, is it's a foundation. It's a starting point. And that starting point, that foundation, allows for future works not just within Mistborn, I'm hoping, but also Stormlight to go on and do greater, grander, more complex things. It you have to start somewhere, and you can't you can't do epic right off the bat. You just you just can't. Part of why a book that is four thousand pages into the story can be so epic is because you've gone on such a journey through 4,000 pages. You just can't do that in 500 pages of Mistborn. And so it's hard to actually put a rating on Mistborn. I almost need to go and come back to my rating after I've read all of this Mistborn trilogy, because I need to see where this is going. Right. If this is just the foundation for Vin, if this is just the setup so that we know who this is and that she can grow into the rest of a story that really goes deep into her personality, her self-worth, all of those elements, then I can come back and say, yes, this was great. But if it doesn't do that, then I come back and say, well, yeah, this is kind of meh because we don't get into the depth of it all. If this is just the first few steps to get us to the depth of it later, then great, no problem. But it's almost like, I don't know, I almost don't know how to rate it because I need to know whether it's set up for something later or if that's the end of it and it missed a little bit. It could go either way. I think it's interesting. My memory of Mistborn, I cannot... Even if I wanted to spoil that for you, I couldn't. I don't know if there's t more time spent on Vin's like, mental health than there was in book one. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I... I... <laughs> I'm not in the same boat, Trevor, and it hurts. <laughs> it's it's not necessarily like a journey. I'm not even thinking of this as a journey for our characters right now. But just like a scale of, of it all does get a lot more impressive, you know, sure. which is exciting. Um as always, which which is what happens with recur like sequels uh trilogies. All etc. Um, yeah, I'm curious to know, Trevor. You had a, a thought on here that characters are the flaw of the novel for you. Did you talk about that yet? Or I did. I alluded to talking that talking about that while framing Stormlight with spoilers. Um, so okay, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give I'll talk a little bit about it, and then we can revisit it later. There is something about Mistborn, specifically this first book, that I don't care that much about the crew. There is something about Doxon, Ham, um, old guy, what's his name? Clubs. Clubs, yeah. Um, I almost that, said Breeze, but that's very Bre wrong. Breeze, yeah. The, there's something about like that group of five or six guys, Eden, that they they could die on the page, and I would I would feel minimally for them. And I'm not, and I don't know why that is. It it may it may just because of we don't have enough page time with them. Um, maybe I would feel more for them if. We got to see Breeze's family for for a chapter, or Ham sitting at the table talking or talking theology with Sazit for like for a chapter. Like, and I I completely understand that that is not what the Final Empire is going for. We every chapter has a purpose. 
there are 38 chapters there are no interludes that that it is a direct arrow to the lord ruler dying at the end of the book that is your punch that is the that is the goal um i completely understand that we don't have time for for that but i still feel like i should still feel something for these characters and i feel a little bit for them um but but not a not, not a lot do you guys have any thoughts on this this is what i was saying initially in that i think the characters are cool and all serve a specific purpose which i like i don't feel like there's like a repetitive character if that makes sense but there's just not time to to dig into all of these and that's why i think i think if this was written later in brandon sanderson's writing career i think that would have been bigger but also i i actually am questioning myself on that because i don't think the goal of this story was to be stormlight or another like super in-depth story it's meant to be more approachable and like an action kind of thing um so yeah so i guess i was pretty forgiving with that in like considering what the story is there to do I think the characters were fleshed out pretty well, and we get a good picture of their personalities and um, general understanding with them, I guess. But you're right; it, it um, you don't get much time with with each of those characters, especially Yeden. And I think, I think with a a book this length, like you said, you, you just can't, and, and that's probably fine for this type of of medium. There's no way you can get to know all of your supporting cast in in that way but i even felt that way about like kelsier at times and we we even get some emotional flashbacks and moments with kelsier where there is a lot going on there he's a very complex character but even for me like when he died that was a very powerful moment where it was like you know, I paused in my reading was like, wow, did that just happen? That was, that was incredible. That was powerful, but it wasn't overly emotional for me. Yeah. And I think it's just because I, I didn't really build a bond with Kelsier in the way that I do a lot of other characters. Vin is probably the one in this story. I do feel like I've, I've established a bond with Vin. I, I feel for her, I feel emotions when she doesn't see herself as valuable, that sort of thing. Kelsier is just so polarizing. And I, I think I'm on the distanced side of that polarization of Kelsier does a lot of things that are morally questionable. And that creates a division between him and me. That that builds a divide where I say, man, I, I want to like this character. I like a lot about this character, but I also have to kind of emotionally distance myself with him because there's some things that he does that I'm not okay with. And so then when his death comes around, it's it's powerful. It, it's it's moving in that it's momentous, but it's not necessarily the the gut punch that a few other characters would be. And I feel like we just didn't we didn't build up enough of those connections with the characters other than Vit in this story. That would buy that would be my bit on the the character element. Speaking of characters, are y'all right if we talk about our favorite characters? Sure. I I have a decent bit to say, and that is just because I couldn't choose a favorite character. Um, but I'd like to name a couple of my favorites, or, or or at least why I think of them as maybe being my favorite. But I really can't choose someone. And I'm actually starting that list with Kelsier, who has been kind of our heart, hot button character to talk about. Um, and I think the reason that he fascinates me and, and why I ultimately do like him is he's like, he's he's a catalyst for all the change that's going on. Um, he almost feels like an anti-hero, but I, I wouldn't go as far as to say he is an anti-hero. He's just not fully good. He's like chaotic good, you know? Um, he... It's. I think if he was just the knight in shining armor, I think he would still be just as awesome and super, super cool. But he would stand out less as a fantasy character, in my opinion. Um, he's like our mentor, but he's 
not all correct. You know, he 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 doesn't have everything figured out, and he doesn't go about things in the right way all the time. But he does like lead and push towards change. There are a lot of things which I disagree with that he does, but we don't need to go into all that now. But he is like an interesting character. Um, I feel like there's a lot more that meets the eye um, that that you get to at least discuss, which is kind of neat. Um, yeah. Other honorable mention or other mention is Vin, just kind of the protagonist. Really cool to see like a character development arc of like. Honestly, kind of like destitute, weak street urchin to like hero of the ska kind of thing. Like, you know, just the the Cinderella story, if you will. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, is always a cool arc, but pretty straightforward, I guess. Almost being the protagonist almost feels like there's plot armor, you know. But still, just a neat character and, and someone that I can always enjoy reading about. Um, and my other name to throw out there was Sazed, of just kind of being like the kind of like the Alfred for Batman. He's kind of like mm. the attentive squire, butler, knowledgeable, good counsel. Like the the one who I would actually say is like wise and thoughtful. Uh, but also like when Vin is in trouble, he's like going to go in and try to bust up shop. You know, he's going to go in and, and dive in head first. Yeah. Even whenever he is logical and probably knows, like, oh, this is bad, I would probably can't do this. He's gonna just go in anyways, out of a lo- like sense of loyalty, which he'd probably like leaning towards. If if I had to pick one, I would say says it is my favorite because he's just cool. <laughs> but um, but th- those were those were the th- three I was thinking about and kind of why. But honestly, like looking at the question, who's your favorite character in this book? I couldn't really decide. You said something interesting that I just want to highlight real quick, that Kelsier is our mentor, but you also don't want to listen to everything he says. Like, there's a cool dynamic there of, yes, Kelsier is Finn's mentor, but you need to take it with a grain of salt because he's a little bit crazy when it comes to noblemen. Like, if you say nobleman in the room with him, he's going to he's gonna tick. He's going to ha- have something switch in his brain and couple that with the most cautious person ever in Vin who does not trust anyone until the last like I don't know eight chapters of the book where she does actually begin to trust at least Sazed and um that there's just an interesting dynamic there that Kelsey is trying to get Vin to open up um but there's a that there's a healthy boundary that Vin has with Kelsier of you are that you're not seeing the good in the in the noble men like I am. I think if we're talking favorite characters, I had I had trouble picking one for for reasons we kind of just talked about about characters, but I think it is Vin, just because she's the one I've had the the strongest connection to, and I I have the highest hopes for her. Going forward, I hope that we get to continue her character journey as we as we go forward. But I like her come from nothing and discover her own worth type path. If I had to throw honorable mentions out there, Marsh, I think, would make the list. We, we don't see a whole lot of him, but man, that guy's commitment to the cause. Kelsey's committed to a cause. Marsh is very committed to the cause as well. Uh, Say Zed probably makes the list as well. He's, but we didn't, we don't get to see a whole lot of maybe personality out of him per se, but he's definitely a likable dude. So I answered this question in a different way. The, the way I approach a favorite character is not like they are my favorite person in the book, but they are my favorite dynamic of, of a group or, or uh, on the page. And the way I, uh, the way I like a character more is obviously more page time. The the more page time they have, they're going to pique my interest more, and I'm going to like the character more. So, if each character had equal page time in the book, I think my favorite character or the most interesting character to me would actually be the Lord Ruler. 
um, the Lord Ruler, there's a lot of interesting dynamics and unanswered questions with all of the revelations we get at the end of Part 5 and all, all of those. Um, but I actually answered this question on the outline here with who I would like to hang out with the most. And that would be Ham. Ham is the pewter arm family guy who uh, is yeah. yes he he's he's there to hang out and have a good time but also there to talk philosophy with you if you would like to talk philosophy he's got a wife and kids at home that's why he's out and about doing it, his uh his employment stuff he sends all his money back to his wife who nobody actually knows where she is because he wants to keep her to keep her safe in case something goes wrong with him. So I, I think Ham would be the, the the coolest guy to hang out with in, in the book. So I think Ham's my favorite character. It's a good way of putting it. I like that. So before we talk about quotes, there was one more kind of general thought I wanted to visit here before we go too far. And that was the incredibly hyped magic system that we yeah. experienced here in this book. That was that was one thing that I knew of going into this book was that it was a major element and one that even just the the brief hints and offhand mentions from people or references, maybe even in the stories we've read to kind of the the magic systems really had me intrigued. And so that was that was my high expectation going into this book was an interesting magic system. And I got to say, we, we definitely got that. I think Alamancy particularly lived up to that expectation. We got a really cool, really well fleshed out, well cleverly crafted magic system that is very kind of scientifically structured, very kind of chemistry minded with the metals and the alloys and the whole balance between internal and external forces and what is it uh, yeah physical and emotional it all just fit together really well really cleverly i could never come up with a magic system like that never and so to to read one that clearly has a lot of thought put into it and that works really well is was was really fun and to see it then become this this canvas that we then get to see Brandon paint with at the end of the story is super cool. And what I mean by that is Alamancy is cool on its own, but then to see how you can then apply creativity to Alamancy and what you can do with it is even cooler. So to see Kelsier and Vim come up with such innovative ways to use the powers they have to defeat their opponents is really, it was really pretty awesome. I enjoyed it a lot. We move on to favorite quotes. I'm ready. There's a couple things in general thoughts that I want to talk about, but I want to talk about it in our stormlight spoiler section. So we'll, we'll come back to some of that. Um, I will start. I have one favorite quote and it's from Kelsier, our, um, polarizing character Kelsier. It's actually not a spoken quote. It's an internal dialogue quote. He's visiting the army in the caves in chapter like 26 or something like that. And he's having a little bit of PTSD going into this cave because of what he went through at the pits and what happened to Mayor and um, stuff like that. And he's going down and descending into these caves and he has a, a bit of a panic attack and he wants to leave and uh, kind of regroup himself so that the, the army can see a well put together leader. And then he has an internal dialogue that says, no, it is okay for them to see me be could like be ha have a weakness it, with the, with the caves. And he says, let them see my weakness and let them see me overcome it. Which I think is a really cool, like, one-liner quote to put on your, you know, pillow or throw a pillow on your couch or whatever. Um, that It's just a very nice line that Brandon Sanderson put in there uh, 
for, from Kelsier. So that's mine. And it's almost more powerful because it's an internal dialogue for me. It, it's not something that he's saying to another character to try and inspire them or to try and push them through a moment. It's something he's saying to himself to get himself through a difficult moment, which for, for some reason, I think even elevates it even higher for me, that it's not him putting on a front or anything. That's, that's truly the internal dialogue he's having. I had a couple to share. One comes pretty early in the story. It's when Kelsier is teaching Vin about the different metals and how to how to use them, how to do the magic that she's just now learning about. And they're specifically learning about steel and iron. And Vin is kind of caught into the point where she's like, you know, this is kind of complicated. And Kelsey responds with this. This is the great art of Allomancy, Vin. Knowing how much or how little you will move when you burn steel or iron will give you a major advantage over your components. You'll find that these two are the most versatile and useful of your abilities. And that, that first line, that this is the great art of Allomancy, I, think it, I thought it was great. That this truly is an art form in a way because it opens itself up to such that creativity that I was just talking about. The second one, a little more thematic. This one's a little bit tough to read because it's split throughout a discussion. This is a discussion between Vin and Sezed, and they're talking about the nature of change. And I, I say it's hard because I'm just going to read the Sezed half of this discussion because in between this are very long Vin dialogues that I'm not going to read. If you if you want to get the full quote, definitely go. Check it out. It's a, it's a great chapter. It's in chapter 29 of the, the book, but I don't want to sit here and read for 10 minutes, so I'll just read you the Sezed portions. That is the nature of all life, mistress, Sezed said. The world must change. It's a change for the better, Sezed said. And Vin goes on and on again, but then Sezed comes back with, then mistress, he said quietly, Simply enjoy what you have. The future will surprise you, I think. And and his just positive take on change, I thought was was refreshing there. Vin is really scared about what's going to change, what's going to happen, what what could happen in the future. And and Sezed's take on it is so much more happy, I guess, in saying that, yeah, change happens in the world, but you never know. Could be change for the better. And I I like that outlook on things as opposed to constantly fearing change, assuming it's going to be worse. Those are my two. I've got two as well. The first one, um, I'll actually go ahead and read, and I felt like such an idiot. I wrote this down because it was my favorite quote from the book, and I managed to not write down what chapter or page it was on, and so I don't remember. So if you are watching on YouTube, and you know where this quote is, please comment, because I spent like a solid 15, 20 minutes trying to find it earlier and couldn't. So, um, But the quote itself, I believe, is from Sezid. We were thinking to Kelsier, maybe it was to Vin, but I think it's to Kelsier. Um, and he says, our belief is often the strongest when it should be weakest. That is the nature of hope. And, and kind of this whole adage of hope, uh, which maybe that was to Vin. I don't actually remember. Um, and the other quote I have, which we do know where it is, uh, page 557 of the short edition book here, the, the, the real short version, or small book. Um, belief, is it simply a thing for fair times and bright days, I think? What is belief? What is faith, if you don't continue in it after failure? And that one was, says it. And one of the reasons why he's one of my favorite characters, how uh, wise and insightful. And honestly, that's that's uh, a big point on the theme aspect of our of our story that I appreciate. Um, those moments are just kind of more minimal, I think, in uh, this book. Says it wins. He's three out of our five favorite quotes. Quotable. Yep. He's very quotable. <laughs> he is very quotable. All right, gentlemen. 
this next 10 minutes might just turn into grilling Elliot for answers and um, prediction segment. But before we get into Stormlight discussion, um, Elliot, do you have any Well of Ascension? I have a couple Well of Ascension predictions that are genuine, but I, I don't remember if they're in there or not. Um, but we're going to go into Well of Ascension predictions and then like unanswered questions, like things that were presented to us in this book that weren't maybe like flash in the face of this is a big question, but maybe it was a subliminal, like there's more to know here. And if you're paying attention, then um, you can, you can see that there's more to know here. Uh, I, I'll go first real quick. And with the Well of Ascension predictions, I am expecting and hoping for more Chandra. I, I, I want to see, I want to see more from the Chandra and what exactly they are. And didn't Ellen's dad have a Chandra in the room at one point? Um, so we know there's at least two in the city or were in the city. So there's, I'm hoping for more Chandra. I am also expecting more like Luthadel politics. So the Lord Ruler just fell. I want to know how much implication that has moving forwards, or if somebody is going to rise up to fight Elend and just take back the whole empire and become the new Lord Ruler. Like, where are we going from here? Because it's it's certain, like, the work is not over. Some evil person could still step in and fight Elend and his new government that was established within, like, two pages before the end of the book. So... There, there, there's a lot to settle, um, in in the Well of Ascension for as far as like Luthadel goes. That's all I have for that. I I will say, um, the one thing that I want to say about this, looking at the Well of Ascension. This is a trilogy, but I feel like it's a book one, and then, then like a duo, if that makes sense, like like a book, and then almost like a a book and a sequel if that makes mm -hmm. sense like I like the you could have the end of the uh the final empire be like the little intro to the well of ascension and almost start there if that makes sense it's like uh the first book of mistborn makes like a complete story hero is brought up kills the lord ruler and it's almost like what okay cool what's what could what could possibly be next and 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 stuff, and we're just kind of left with questions of what could be next, where I feel like it's almost starting from from a new story point, which um, won't exactly be true. But anyways, I, I was just thinking about that. Well, I'll tie into that with one of my predictions for Well of Ascension, which is I predict that we will see some middle of the trilogy book syndrome in that even if the the second two are different than the first one, I'm I'm a little worried. I'm not so worried. It it works out fine in some books, but I anticipate we're going to need to get to somewhere to set up our final book. We're going to need to develop everything to a certain point to enable the epicness of the last book. The second book often just becomes the the train ride to get there. It just becomes the I need to get from A to B. Second book is my my way to get there. B is really where I want to be. Third book. I'm a little worried we're going to get some of that in that it does feel like we've wrapped up a story. It does feel like we've kind of gotten the, okay, now what moment. I hope we don't end up stalling too much in resetting up everything we need to get to in the third book. That could potentially hurt our book too. And I think I'm predicting we may see some of that. Who knows? As far as other predictions, maybe this is more of a hope, an ask, a request, a request for Well of Ascension. I want to see more of Scadrill. I feel like we know Luthadel well and not much else. So I'm really hoping we get to see more. I'm hoping we go other places. I'm hoping we see more 
landscapes, maybe more about the ash mounts, maybe get to see some water. I feel like we haven't seen any any water anywhere. Are there are there even bodies of water on this uh, on this place? I don't know. So I'm predicting and hoping we will do that. Another prediction that's maybe in the request hope category is the the Vin character journey. I've talked about this like twice already, so we won't beat this uh, beat this too much more. But I do hope that we continue that uh, that Vin uh, journey. Maybe a, a different character that's more of a prediction that's kind of out there. I think I think we're going to run into some issues with Ellen. Ellen just got made ruler of this entire empire right that's kind of mm -hmm. where we left things yep as far as i know ellen has zero experience with that sort of thing like absolutely none in fact as far as we know ellen actively avoids that kind of thing of trying to not be involved in politics and all the huda that comes with being a noble. And so while I think his heart is absolutely in the right place and I trust him to be in that kind of position, power corrupts. Power is also hard to wield if you're not used to wielding it. And so putting Ellen in such a powerful position with zero experience, I'm going to predict that's not going to go well. Somehow. Another dynamic I would like, or I just have a question on is the Lord Ruler was just dethroned. How much impl or how, how much sway does that have over not Luthadel? You, you mentioned you want to see not Luthadel in book two. Like, you know, back in the prologue of the book, we have this random mansion out on the countryside. Kelsier burns it down. I want to know what the contents of book one has like how much sway that has over this random, like these random towns about the empire. Like, is that really going to change anything for the ska that the Lord ruler is dead or is nothing going to happen? They have to march an army around everywhere to free all the ska. Like, is that, I, I don't know. That, that's the question I have for the well of ascension of how much sway did this actually have over common person z over here yeah we we got the epic moment where they took down the lord ruler but now we get to the the messy part right. which is okay you you took down the evil dictator but now you're still left with an empire you're still left with all this infrastructure that that dictator has built up that just doesn't go away overnight right how do you how do you go about cleaning that up do you go about cleaning that up or do you just kind of stand up a, a separate government and say no we're starting over here from scratch feel free to join us there's a lot of ways that this could go ellen does not have the experience to do that well it's my prediction and then yeah that's pretty much it more magic i think we're gonna get more magic either additional magic systems that we haven't seen yet or more about the two that we did see there were definitely hints about here's all the rules, but wait a second, certain people can break the rules and oh wait, there's actually more here that you didn't that you weren't told originally. So I'm predicting very confidently that we will be diving into that more. This does leave me with a few, and I I do mean a few, because if you go listen to our Stormlight episodes, I finish those books with a lot of unanswered questions. There's there's a number of things we kind of came across as we went that were either just mentioned briefly or weren't really fully explored. I only had about what do I have here written? Seven? Eight. Seven ish yeah. questions. Eight, something like that. I think I ended Way of Kings with like forty nine or something like that. Just the nature of the book. Just running through these real briefly, and you guys can chime in with any thoughts or ironic questions, whatever you want to input in my uh we'll see what happens but some of the big things that i'm wanting to find answers on some of the things i have written down in my notes to look for as we go into the next book these would be more information about the mists more information about what is going on with the mists there seems to be something 
more there in how they react to certain people differently. Kind of one of the elements I'm looking for. Probably the biggest one is why does Vin get to break the rules? Why does Vin get to sense magic when she shouldn't? And those types of things. The mist might be tied into that a little bit. The mist seems to react to Vin in different ways at different times. All those I'm looking for. I want to learn about more allomantic metals. We know that there's at least one more that should be out there, which should be, I think, an alloy of atium. That would kind of complete our set of metals that we have, where we have a, an elemental metal paired with a alloy. We have all the ones we've seen so far have a nice pairing. ATM is the exception, but then there's also kind of a hint that, oh, maybe there's more out there. I don't know. We'll see. I want more more metals. The deepness, that's the name of it, right? The deepness. Mm -hmm. Yep. As this mystical force that the the Lord Ruler, I think, supposedly subdued. And that's part of his kind of claim to fame, I suppose, is he defeated the deepness and saved everyone what is that we never got an explanation of what that was other than a evil dark force of some kind i have questions still about vin's mother she was referenced a few times but not a whole lot we think that she was trying to kill vin i think and that vin was saved from her seeming to allude that there's maybe a madness going on there or a you know, literal craziness going on. Not sure. I want to learn more. Not sure if we're going to learn more on that one. Ferrochemy. Want to learn more about Ferrochemy. We got some descriptions. We I, I understand the basics, I think, but I'm sure there's way more. At least, you know, even a, a list of all the things you can do with with Ferrochemy. Is there is there more? I'm sure there is. My last one is kind of an interesting one, which Perhaps our audiobook folks may not have even keyed in on. Something I was looking for after early, after pretty early on in the book, is these symbols. At the beginning of each of our chapters, there is a there's a heading. There's a little symbol, almost like a like a glyph or a logo of some time. And when we first started the chapters, I kind of assumed that they were going to be numbers like it was a number symbol system unique to this world. But I don't think that's the case. I don't remember if they repeat at any time or if literally every 38 chapters has a different one. I should go back and check that. But then I got to the end of the book and I read the, uh, the Ars Arcanum at the back of the book. And it seems to, no, it does. It very clearly ties w one of those symbols to each of our metals that we have. Yep. Iron, steel, tin, pewter, they all have a matching symbol that goes along with them. So there's there's eight of them accounted for, I guess, but there's way more that show up throughout the book. And I was fully expecting those to come into the story at some point. It's like, what are these symbols? Are they just a writing system that this world has? Is They didn't seem to show up anywhere, like at all. Where did they come from? What are they? What do they mean? I need these answers. They're on the border of our uh, thumbnails on YouTube. They're on the stuff you've put out. They're in like pictures on the maps, and yeah, they're everywhere. And yet had may... zero. Yeah, I may be with you. I, I've never really thought about what those symbols are. I'm really curious to know. Anything else? Somehow I don't know that I believe you. <laughs> yeah. Don't know that I believe that statement, but nice try. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. For any Mistborn only listeners, we will be taking a break and not jumping straight into Well of Ascension next week. We are going to be doing a month or so of Stormlight current content that will be substituting our normal flow. There will be an 11th medal. Um, episode probably within a couple weeks from now that you can read along with us. The 11th medal is meant to be read at any point. It's kind of a short story that can substitute as a prologue to 
Mistborn, um, if you want to just get a little bite size. We'll be talking about that at some point in the next couple weeks. Um, so you can join us for that. And then we're going to be reading Secret Project 3. And then we'll be returning for the Well of Ascension. So it'll likely be somewhere around September 1st or so that we'll be reconvening for the Well of Ascension. That would be my guess. Um, but until then, if you're um, a Mistborn only reader, we're going to be going to Stormlight spoiler content. Here we go. Anyone want to start? Uh oh, Stormlight time. I said that, but you go ahead and start. <laughs> I'll I'll start us with something that's actually been on my mind a lot as I've been digesting the final empire here. The the black and whiteness, if that's a term, of the of the villains, of the bad guys in this story kind of caught me off guard. Just because in Stormlight, the villains are never one-dimensional. Yeah. They are always multi-dimensional they have complex motives they have oftentimes relatable motives or in the case of like the parshendi they're completely misunderstood things like that the bad guy is never really just the embodiment of evil and then we come over here to mistborn and so i have all that in my in my head and i'm fully expecting every villain we meet to be complex like that and the lord ruler could easily be that. I don't know that we got a lot of, enough about the Lord Ruler, especially because we had the all our all of our epigraphs are from a journal from someone who turns out to not be the Lord Ruler. And so there if that had turned out to be a Lord Ruler, that would have been an extremely complex character. It turns out that's not. So Rat Rashek. Rashek is the Lord guy? Ruler. Um, right. The author is not Rashek. Rashek we don't really know much about. Right. But it seems like there could be some complex motives there. There could be a reason why he's doing all that he's doing. We'll probably find that out. That was kind of a our, our cliffhanger, if you will, at the end of the book. Where I where I want to point to is the Inquisitors. The Inquisitors, to me, seem pretty straightforward. They're just evil, which I have no problem with at all. That I... I don't necessarily need my villains to be complex or relatable or things like that. I'm okay with a with a black and white villain. I was just very caught off guard by it because we hadn't seen a Brandon Sanderson villain like that before that I can really think of. And then to meet these people that delight in torture for the sake of torture is very different than what yeah. I was expecting. What were your guys' thoughts? I, I, I like what you're saying. So a lot of the villains that we see are still people, you know, like it's still a person. Yeah. So it's like complex of the things that have happened to them and the things that they have done to lead them up to that point. Whereas our Inquisitors seem like that humanity has been taken away. Yeah. Or like re removed or like destroyed. My brain goes to the Nazgul. It. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually kind of a good way of thinking of it almost. It's like, they were men once, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I'm in the boat also that they're, I think they're just fully evil. And I also think that's perfectly okay and good. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I think that is because they're not really like, they don't seem to really be human or co cognitive and feeling of emotions like humans are, I guess. Um, or I wonder, too, based on some of the information we get from Marsh at the end of the book, I wonder if it's going to stem from the fact that they live in such pain all the time, that that has just so incredibly numbed them to everything, that it's the equivalent of what you're talking about. Their humanity is gone. They, they've endured such pain for so long that life is not even meaningful for them anymore. And so torture is all they can get from life because it's pain is something they can relate to. Like maybe that's the, the story. It still definitely seems a, you've gone from human to no, that's just evil. There's no if, ands or buts about it. That's just evil. There's an interesting dynamic that I wish was explored 
And it may be in Mistborn, but I don't remember if it is. I don't think it is. There's an interesting dynamic of immortal beings valuing mortal life that I I really wish could be discussed at some point in the Cosmere. Because we get the Lord Ruler, who is immortal, and sacrifices Ska at the drop of a hat. D does not care, uh, clearly, about any Ska lives. Probably doesn't care about his nobleman lives either. Um, and you could, I could easily see the mental, um, or the, the discussion being, what is the difference if they die today or if they die in 80 years? You know, what, what, what is the difference? Uh, that being the, the Lord Ruler's mental image. And then we have Hoyd, on the other hand, who is, for all intents and purposes that we know of, immortal. And going around and helping anyone he can, at least by the time Stormlight rolls around. That is his purpose on Roshar, or at least that's, that's in his letter to Frost. Um, he is saying, we need to help these people because they're in the lamp with Odium. I, I cannot leave Odium on Roshar because of these people. I need your help. And I, I, I would be really interested in a, that Hoyt is from Yolin. Um, I don't know if that's written anywhere, but that's on the wiki. Um, that that's the world that Frost and Hoyd are from. Um, I'd be interested in a book of immortal people valuing mortal lives um, at some point in the Cosmere, because I think there's a really interesting dynamic there that I don't, I'm not sure has been really explored. I just wanted That's to. Fair. And I just wanted yeah, to say that I while like, I thought of it. Uh, yeah, I, I like that, and I'm, I was trying to think of why. Like, why don't they just go mind their own business and do whatever you know like you know but i mean in the context of stormlight or the whole overarching hoid story it's probably like a they there's like a necessity for the mortal people in or because my understanding is like hoid and these other characters can't defeat odm or whatever may be evil on their own I'm assuming because if they could, they probably would have. Right. Um. Maybe that's similar for the Lord, Lord Ruler, and we don't know what he was. You know, wh why would he? Why would he bother with mortal people? Right. Like, like, did he just want to? Was it just something to do? Like, it's more exciting than just being on your own. Or was there something like deeper? You know, what was there something he enjoyed or delighted in, or you know? Stuff like that. You can also throw Warbreaker in here as well, right? With the breaths and Sasebron being fed breaths from mortal people to stay immortal, like that. There's a there's a setup there that I assume is intentional. Um, that I think we'll get at some later point. Back to your point, Elliot. I think Odium may be the only pure evil that we've been presented with besides Inquisitors. Is there, or I'm sorry, think... Rays. Current current Odium, there's an argument for a, a di dynamic, like, hard villain. Rays, I don't think there is. Rays is on a quest to be yeah. the only shard. Right. That's fair. I was going to say, the, the that's... awkward part with, with those, with Rays and, like, these vessels is there's still like a motive that they believe is right or at least they tell you but that it's right maybe that's just deception mm -hmm. but it's like uh raises like i want control over everything so that i can make a peaceful thing or whatever or so somewhere in his mind there's it's going to be better once he's in charge of everything that is what he tells um, dalinar i'm not sure if that's really true but yeah yes I yeah and I, I fully agree with you but at least whenever you have the kind of like humanoid cognitive element, there is still like room for that. Sure. Like lots of villains you'd see like have their motives or something that they think they think they are going to do something good. Um, 
but then you know you can look at it objectively and be like that is extremely not good in fact uh but but i think compared to the inquisitors it's a little bit different because i mean there's some like human rationale in there but like there's it's it's different you know there's not that like motive it's like they delight in evil because it's evil kind of thing right yeah i couldn't agree more i think that's the, that's the difference odium raise odium i agree probably our closest comparison teravangian makes that way more complicated but completely agree with everything you just said paul raise has a motive the inquisitors could have a motive that maybe we're going to learn about in later books but as of what we've learned so far in just this first book, it seems like the Inquisitors are just there to do evil. Yeah. And there's, a, I guess, one little question mark by the end of the book there because Marsh seems to have kept his humanity. Right? So why do 99% of Inquisitors, instead of 100% of Inquisitors, lose their humanity? And definitely eyes on Marsh for exactly that reason. Is Marth, Marth, really in uh... nah, 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 nah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, character Christ. swapping there. The uh, Marsh, definitely eyes on Marsh. Is he on a path that goes to that destination no matter what? Right. Is is that what he is becoming, or is there some kind of choice in there? Sure. Is there, you can choose to be a not pure evil inquisitor. And all those other Inquisitors simply chose to be that way? Or does simply being an Inquisitor eventually drive you to that ultimate end? Yeah. Do you, Elliot, I guess this is just a question for you. Um, prediction Are we going to get a negative or Mistborn B, I should say? We, uh, compared to Stormlight, where you get to understand Stormlight and the Night's Radiant, and then by the end of Book Three, Book Four, you get Voidlight and Fused and the 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 mirror of of Stormlight. Are we going to get Mistborns and then Smokeborns, or are we just going to get Mistborns versus Mistborns and that's it? Ooh, I really like this question a lot. I did not think about this until I saw it in your outline, and it got my my wheels turning in in the old noggin. I want to say, I want to say no, just because I can't think of a good way to negatize that. I can't think of an inverse necessarily that would match well. It seems like we have a very well and well crafted symmetrical ish system that we've built with Alamancy. To flip that on his head and talk about an inverse seems like it would maybe wreck that apple cart a little bit. And I don't think that's the direction we are going in. But part of the whole Knight's Radiant versus Fuse comes from having multiple shards on a single planet. Yeah. I know, based on information you've fed me and kind of stuff we've picked up along the way... And math. <laughs> ...that there's more than one shard <laughs> and math, that there are more than one shard on Scadrial. And so with that kind of outside knowledge, I could see that being a part of answering the question you're asking here. So maybe? But I want to say no. I don't think, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really know, but I want to say no. I don't think so. Where's I, our I, Where's our big bad guy, Elliot? And this is the other question. This actually ties in together for me because part of that dichotomy on Roshar, I think comes from the fact that we have two shards and the two shards are at war. Right. Ish. Not getting the impression that that's true on Scadrial, although things are definitely not going great on Scadrial, so maybe that could be. This could be the result of a war between two shards. I don't... I have no evidence to point to, but I don't feel like that's the direction we're going here. That it's going to be one shard versus the other. And so I don't... 
I don't think that feeds into your inverse of Mistborns. To answer your second question there, where's the big bad guy? I'm looking for those shards. What are they doing? Who are they impacting? Is our ultimate bad guy one of those shards, a vessel of one of those shards, like we are dealing with on Roshar? Maybe. Also, maybe not. It, it, we've gotten the impression from discussions from Odium himself, I think mainly, that Odium is a bit of an anomaly in the shard world. Yeah. That those other shards out there are generally doing positive things for the planets that they're on. They're trying to build worlds around themselves that are good worlds, at least in a sense. Odium seems to be maybe not the only one, but a bit of off the brand in that he's very destructive. He's out there to just smash, Odium smash. So am I expecting one of the shards here on schedule to be the big bad guy? Probably not in that sense. Okay. I am expecting to come across someone on that scale. I am expecting that we're going to meet someone who is either a shard, a vessel, or someone... Hoyd's not really the best comparison, right but he's kind of the... Sure. S someone who has Cosmere level knowledge or is here on Skadriel trying to do things for their own benefit at a cosmic scale. I'm expecting that kind of person. The Lord Ruler was very powerful. The Lord Ruler was extremely powerful. They had two different... He had two different magic systems at his command and could do incredible things with it. I think we're going to meet at some point here someone who is looking to affect the universe at an even higher level, who's going to have impacts on the Cosmere as a whole. Just because I think I know that's how Brandon Sanderson's brain works. Brandon does not think small scale. Even the small scale things that he does fit into a bigger picture that is huge, massive, beyond my imagination, usually. And so if the ultimate bad guy on Skadriel is someone like the Lord Ruler, I'll be pretty surprised. So I think I think we there's a higher power. There's a higher power out there. Probably not a shard. That's my that's my guess. Anything else? I think we covered everything I wanted to talk about. Same here. All right. We can we can close for for now. I am very much looking forward to the Well of Ascension when we get there. I am very excited to read the Well of Ascension. I haven't read it since probably 2018, I think, is when the last time I read it. I remember exactly one scene, and I remember another scene that is either in the Well of Ascension or the Hero of Ages, and I don't remember which one. So I will find out if it's in the Well of Ascension later on this year. But for now, we're going to pause Mistborn. We are going to be doing Secret Project 3 when it comes out July 1st. And uh, in the meantime, we're going to be doing a couple bite-sized Stormlight uh, episodes to keep us fresh there. Do a little bit of a retrospective um, and read some epigraphs as well. So you can expect that um, on your feed for the next month or so. And until then, we will reconvene next week. Thanks for joining me, Paul and Elliot. Looking forward. Of course.